So some of you might know or remember that I, not so long ago, in the last decade, attended Seattle University for seminary, which is a Jesuit seminary, although they don't actually train priests there, interestingly enough. Jesuits are very scholarly, and they are liberal on many things, but they still have those Catholic Christian roots way back, going way back. So at this seminary, there are seven Unitarian Universalists. So we sit through lecture after Christian lecture, respecting the Christian beliefs of our classmates, but also trying to translate them into how do we apply this in a bigger, multi-faith way, and how do we also have this be consistent with humanist thought. So imagine, if you will, in Christology class, when the death of Jesus is being discussed in great gory detail, which I will completely spare you this morning. I raised my, I sit there for a long time with this question on my lips, and I finally raised my hand, and it's the Catholic priest who is in uh, Chino's in a polo shirt. He's not in his, you know, he's not in his uh, ritual dressing. But I put up my hand and I say, and he finally calls on me, with all sincerity and respect, if the triumph over death is the resurrection, then did humankind really need crucifixion? What if Jesus died years later of natural causes? What if he just died from old age rather than having been crucified? And if he rose at that point, would Christians still be saved? Now, this is the proverbial, you could have heard a pin drop, except I swear I could hear the dust coming down on the desk. I was like, oh! So he starts pacing back and forth across the front of the classroom in his turquoise blue polo shirt. Back and forth and back and forth. I look a little bit to my right where I know that one of my more conservative Christian classmates is sitting. His face is turning red. And I know what he's thinking. He's thinking, why do they let those Unitarian Universalists in here in the first place? Get her out. But my friend is sitting to my left. And I happen to know, she's an Episcopalian, that they are in my camp. Be because I know, Neil, would you please go out to this door right now? There's a quest question that only you can answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Episcopalian friend was sitting to my left. Um, I happen to know she's in the camp that no horrific death was required, just resurrection, because she lost her own child in an accident. And she cannot believe in a God that would require the death of a child. But the instructor is still pacing. And he says, you know what? I need to think about this until next week. And I want every one of you to think about it too. <clears throat> so in my quest to think about it, I drove into the book, Saving Paradise, by the authors I just talked about, because it had been on my bookshelf. And I'm in seminary. I have no time to read other books. So <clears throat> I start reading, and I find this amazing story that they find about researching how paradise in Eden in the early Christian church crucifixion became crucifixion and empire. What they found is this was not adopted to the church in the church until 10 centuries after the story of the death, life and death of Jesus. Instead, it was all focused around a life-giving message. So they had questions. When did this, when was this crucifixion became a necessary thing? So they go to Italy, and they go to Turkey, and they go to other sites. So they find that the earliest Christian art images have no crucifixion. They are in the plaster line walls of tombs, and they're carved into marble sarcophagi. 
They contain biblical images, Daniel and the lion, Jonah and the whale. They're images of baptism and healing. So they have continue on their work, and they do not find one image of a crucified Jesus until they find this enormous door that was made about 425 in the Common Era. So they find of 32 images, the one, well, your left, the one in the upper left actually has Jesus with very small wooden blocks in his hands. There's no suffering. There's no goriness. And Brock and Parker saw this as an image of victory over death. Jesus was not suffering, and in this, in this plaque, he was clearly not dead. So the other 32 images were more important, and the ones that came at eye level had nothing to do with his death. They also go into churches to look at the oldest mosaics they can find, 5th and 6th century. And they found more of these early images. There is a picture of the Last Supper. They do find one image of Simon carrying the cross, but there is no image. There's no gore. There's no death. There is an angel who sits before the tomb. There are remaining images of a risen Jesus. No agony was required. They simply did not find the dead body for the first thousand years. So they returned back to the United States and they asked Christian art scholars, are there images they know of? And they did not. So most of us have heard again and again that most Christians believe in the crucifixion of Jesus, the Messiah, who saved the world. For Rebecca Parker, she says this sets up an idea that suffering it's suffering as saving, and this is justifies slavery, war, domestic violence holding a painful death as a supreme model of sacrificing love leaves all of us at risk. And she says it leaves perpetrators uh, not held responsible for their unethical and sometimes abusive behavior. So now that they know what they haven't found, they're like, wait, we forgot to look at what we did find. So they go back to some of these sites. They go back through their photographs. They go to um, the Church of St. Giovanni. So they, of course, are met with all the more modern images. But they find an apse that's behind a velvet rope. It's behind chairs to block where they're supposed to be and behind an altar. So of course, they like, oops, didn't see that velvet rope. Oops, I think I'll just go in here. <laughs> So what they find is paintings. They find Jesus with this golden countenance against a dark blue sky that's strewn with clouds and some stars over on one side. There is a crescent moon and a dawn sky. And there's a dove that emerges. And there's streams of water that come from the dove's beak, which is the Tigris and the Euphrates. And if you know your Bible, the Pishon and the Gishon as well. Sheep and deer are drinking from the streams, and there's a golden city nestled with peacocks and palm trees, which are signs of immortality. The rivers eventually merge with the Jordan, and they later understood that these pictures, these paintings, these mosaics, were par they were depictions of paradise here on earth. They compared their photos and their notes and all their memories and, and what they saw the most of on their trip, on their quest, was verdant meadows filled with flowers and fruit trees, cosmos of stars and midnight sky and golden sunsets. Abundance was everywhere. And the mosaics captured the world's luminosity. And there was this depiction of heaven on earth. Even paradise was here on earth. There were pictures of paradise. And there was one particular place in paradise where those who have died had gone. Note no depictions of hell. And it's also important to know in early Christendom, it was a, still a sin to shed human blood. 
If someone had to serve in the military or had to take a life in self-defense, there was a great purification uh, rituals and baths and welcoming back into the community, and they were asked to do a penance of some sort, which sometimes meant um, serving the poor in some way. So something that could bring that full circle. And the Eucharist communion during that time was a feast of life. It, it was the image of, an, of the risen Jesus. So what happened to all this beauty? How is it that Christians which wish to see their God suffer and die? There's an enormous Gothic cathedral outside Cologne, Germany. It has the earliest surviving crucifix. It's sculpted from oak in Saxony. It was sculpted around 960 Common Era. By the end of the medieval period, those gory depictions of the crucifix were everywhere. This is when we also began to see stern images of Christ enthroned in judgment, presiding over a graveyard where he would decide who was saved and who was damned. Brock and Parker followed the trail of clues, and they found it led back to King Charles the Great, better known as Charlemagne. And I believe he lived from 1740 to 1820, something close. I'm sorry, 742 to 1814. This is what happens when I go off script. 814. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, he didn't. De yeah, okay. Wasn't like Benjamin Button. All right, I got it. <laughs> 742 to 18. To 820. So for three decades, Charlemagne fought against the Saxons on the northern border of what he referred to as his lands. With the threat of death, Saxons were forced into Christian conversion. However, they were sneaky. So there are early images in the cathedral outside Cologne, the Jero cross, this early cross, and other similar in images that were carved into life-size forms and placed at the center of worship, and Saxons were forced to convert. Now, the Saxons lived on both sides of the Rhine as it worked its way to the North Sea. They were mostly an agrarian society, and they lived in small clans. They practiced a form of democracy. They had been admired by the Romans for their skills as warriors and as community builders. So during Roman times, when Saxons were faced with all this Christianity, what they did is they took it and they wove it into their already existing pagan religion, which centered on great holy trees and sacred springs. The local Christians also sometimes came over and participated in the pagan ceremonies, but probably didn't say too much about that. The Saxons paid the Franks an annual tribute of 600 head of cattle. Before Charlemagne was crowned, the English monk named, I'm going to say Boniface because that's the way it looks in print, but they're French, it's probably said differently. He was disturbed by the Saxons not being pure Christians. He said they were steeped in error with this mishmash and joining of the religious practices. So this monk joined with the Frankish soldiers, and he cut down the great religious tree, Idsis. This tree was a tribute to the most sacred tree of mythology and legend, Yggdrasil, which was the cosmic tree of life. The soldiers rooted the shrine, and thousands were killed as they tried to, pr to protect their most um, cherished religious objects. So Charlemagne justified his campaign to convert the Saxons as a victory like Jesus' death through crucifixion. Of course they had to suffer. They had to descend to hell. His court theologians proclaiming Charlemagne's military victories replicated divine salvation. They were marked with the pious and purple dye of precious Jesus' precious blood. So Charlemagne, his army, and his clergy made this shift. Christian acts of penitence now had to include humility and suffering. The Saxons were eventually enslaved. 
This reign altered the long-standing Christian prohibition against shedding of blood and made Christianity finally a full colonizing tool. Not that it hadn't been used for that before, but now this was the basis of its theology. So it is the Saxons who brought us the image of the crucifixion because it was the only way in which they could demonstrate their suffering in a way that is hidden in this bigger Christian message. Theology also changed the way communion was thought of. Communion had been a celebration of life, and now it was, a cele it, now it was to be a remembrance of suffering. And this difference is really important. In Rebecca Parker's words, with the triumph of the Eucharist, it presented death on the communion table. Death, instead of being defeated, now became eternal. What was a traditional communion, Jesus overcoming death, a celebration of abundance, never to die again, became the state of perpetual dying. And of course, the average common person now began to worry more and more, became more in, in filled with anxiety about what was their eternal life going to look like. Because before, to be human was to spend your time communing with the divine. And now it was to be judged by the divine. So the later contribution that followed not too far after with, of suffering for salvation was the righteous warfare of the Crusades. At the time of the Crusades, the 10th century, the Pope advocated religious warfare as a form of love, for its charity to give your life. In the life to come, crusaders would immediately receive remission for all of their sins and be taken into glory. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre by the 11th century had been reversed from their fourth century life of giving rituals where they only mourned crucifixion once a year, and what just, we just um, marked as Good Friday. And then it became daily in people's church attendance. With the resurrection, the abundance, the joy slowly receding. So as I wrap this up, I'm gonna take you back to the Jesuit classroom. My instructor, the retired priest, returns along with the rest of the class. I'm sure he had on a different colored polo shirt because he prided himself on the brightest colored polo shirts he could find. He tells all of us that he has been thinking deeply about the question. Which isn't, he said, he has been thinking about Margot's question. And it's not really my question, it's a question of emphasis. It's a question that we all need to answer for ourselves. And I'm going to say this in two different ways. If you believe in God, what do we see in the face of God? If you are an atheist, a humanist, questioning, what is the ultimate calling of our humanness? The priest finally tells the class, he does not think that the horrific, painful death was necessary. It's the resurrection. It is life that saves us. Whether we are Christian, humanist, Buddhist, or atheist, the answer tells us, live into what is good. Live into what is life-affirming. Live into what is life-giving. That is your paradise.